So welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people joining the Grand Round session today. Um, I'm Dr Gillian Smith. I'm one of the programme leads for the Intercalated BMSC programme. And I'm delighted that we've been given the chance to take over Grand Rounds today to showcase the work of some of our BMSC students. These are students that studied with us in the last academic year, so they've just all returned to fourth year of the MBCHB programme. And this is our annual prize competition. It's an endowed prize within the school, and it is named in memory of Sir James Mackenzie, who we've illustrated here. So Sir James Mackenzie is a, a local physician. He studied medicine in Edinburgh, and after many years as a GP, he, beca he became particularly interested in cardiology and was knighted for his contributions in that field. The reason that we are acknowledging his efforts today are really because he played a leading role in the development of the medical school in St Andrews, which of course, in turn, played a leading role in the development of our own medical school and curriculum here in Dundee. So in honour of Sir James Mackenzie, we have an annual prize competition within the BMSC programme where we have 10 different BMSC courses, and I'll tell you a little bit about more about those in a minute. But at the end of each academic year, each course team working with their external examiner nominates the student in their own course who they feel has delivered the best research project. So we have up to 10 student nominees to start with. We have recently, two or three weeks ago, held the first round of the Sir James Mackenzie Prize competition where students from all of our courses presented their project work to a jury, if you like, of the BMSC course leads. All the presentations were excellent and I think really showcased the quality and the diversity of the students' work. But the three students who are going to be talking to you today did particularly well. They were awarded the top scores in our first round competition. So they're going to have a second opportunity to talk to this wider audience today. Just to remind you about the BMSC programme, this is an optional intercalated year that students can opt to take after year three of the MBCHB programme. And occasionally we're joined by some dental students. Roughly about half of the year group choose to do that every year. And the BMSC programme, as I said, is split into 10 different specialist courses. And this is a very busy slide, but it just makes the point, hopefully, that our students come to us. We teach them as a cohort where we teach them some very important core and academic research skills. They then have a specialist um, first semester of teaching in their course area of choice. But a big attraction for many students entering the BMSC year is this opportunity to carry out a really detailed three month research project when they become fully integrated in one of the clinical or research teams within the school. So it's that work that the students will be presenting you, to you today. These are the three presentations that you will be hearing. Each of the students will talk for probably just a little over five minutes. They will be very happy to answer questions. So please do think when you're listening to the individual presentations of some challenging questions for the students. You'll see that they represent three of our BMSC courses in international, now global health, cardiovascular and diabetes medicine and medical education. And can we ask you all, it's great to see so many people um, on the call with us today, can we please ask you to just stay with us for a couple of minutes at the end, because you have the responsibility of helping us to, to select the final prize winner and the student who's going to be awarded the Sir Jim, James Mackenzie Prize. So there will be a really quick Mentimeter vote at the end. This is just a heads up for anyone that likes to be organized and wants to see the Menti code um, up front. I don't want to be too prescriptive about how you make your assessment, but essentially we're looking for you to vote for the student that you think has given the most engaging presentation, where you think they've given a really comprehensive overview of their project and where they've responded particularly well to your questions. So at the end of the three presentations, you will see something that looks like this, hopefully, if I can make the technology work. 
you'll see that no votes have been cast so far, but we're good to go and we'll come back to that Menti vote at the end. So if there are no further questions, I can see there are some questions in the chat, but I can't read them when I'm sharing my screen. So I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to hand over to Ali from um, BMSC International Health, and she's going to give you the first presentation describing her project. Hi, can you all hear me okay? We can, thank you. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. And can you see that? Yeah, that's all great. If you just toggle it onto the your display settings, Ali, just so that we can see your full screen. At the top, you can see show taskbar and then display settings if you just toggle that oh. to presentation view or whatever, or something similar. Oh. I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, just, just when you press that, mm -hmm. that's it, the top one. It's not clicking. Mm. <laughs> Might just have to do it like this. Is that okay? Yeah, I think we can probably live with that. Okay. Um. Firstly, sorry if the transitions don't work um perfectly, but I can promise you it's a beautiful presentation if the animations work. Um. So let's start. Um. Put your hand up if you turned on the tap this morning without thinking twice about the quality of water it supplied. I think a lot of us. Yeah. Um, we're very lucky to be in this position, but unfortunately, despite safe drinking water being a fundamental human right, this is not yet the universal reality. Hello everyone, my name is Ali and today I'm going to be talking you through the project I recently completed in association with Fisherman's Rest. This is a non-governmental organisation based in Malawi. In their own words, they work with the local community to raise living standards, education and economic opportunity. Among their initiatives is the Madzi Alipo project, meaning there is water in the country's national language of Chichewa. Its aim is to provide safe and clean drinking water in rural, in rural areas. This study built on the work already completed by the dedicated staff at Fisherman's Rest. It involved secondary analysis of water quality data collected in Somba, a traditional authority located here in the south of Malawi. Samples of drinking water were collected from aphrodives, a type of hand pump pictured here. These are the most common source of drinking water in Somba. This work has been continued by the Madzi Alipo team over five seasons between 2021 and 2023. Malawi experiences two distinct seasons, a cooler dry season and a wet season, which is warmer. So how are these samples test? How is the quality assessed? A sample is taken from a hand pump and brought back to the on-site lab at Fisherman's Rest. There, a process called membrane filtration is carried out. This involves passing the sample through what is effectively a sieve to catch contaminant bacteria called thermotolerant coliforms. These are then cultured using the machine pictured here. Thermotolerant coliforms are a subset of coliform bacteria which are present at high concentrations in the gut of warm-blooded animals and humans. They are useful as an indicator bacteria as they can demonstrate an entry route for faecal contaminants into water points. This is a prevalent issue in low-income countries such as Malawi. While thermotolerant coliforms don't necessarily equate to disease causation, consumption of water contaminated with the pathogenic subset of these bacteria, namely E. coli 0157, can cause severe diarrheal disease. Oops, sorry. Sadly, this was the fifth most common cause of um, mortality in Malawi in 2019. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this study had two main aims. Firstly, to identify drinking water sources at risk of contamination, according to the standards set by the World Health Organization, or WHO, and the Malawi Bureau of Standards, or MBS. And then secondly, to assess the, for correlation between the season and the risk of contamination, according to both of these standards. 
Over the whole study period, more than 61% of water points were categorised as at risk of contamination, according to WHO standards, while this figure was just over 17% using MBS standards. This highlights just how much more precautionary WHO standards are, which will be an important consideration for fishermen's rest when deciding how to use these results, weighing up both potential health and financial considerations. I hope that the results of this study can be employed by Fisherman's Rest to inform prioritisation of future water quality monitoring at hand pumps identified as at risk of contamination. Moreover, focusing interventions in this manner may contribute to the reduction of the public health burden associated with consumption of unsafe drinking water in a cost efficient way. Turning to seasonality, no correlation was found between um, season and contamination level according to either set of standards. The reliability of the results of this study is limited by a large number of uncollected samples. I used a complete case analysis approach, which meant that sites where some data was missing were disregarded, reducing the sample size significantly. It could be, therefore be valuable to conduct further analysis of the same data set using a different approach to handle missing data. Additionally, inconsistent results across seasons suggest the presence of one or more confounding variables. Scientific literature indicates that recent rainfall could be a potential protective factor for contamination. Therefore, it is recommended that fishermen's rest record we recent weather conditions in future sampling. Looking forward, a focus on increasing the completeness of data will facilitate further research investigating potential predictive factors for contamination. Recording the time of sampling within each season would make this a known variable which could be important given that wet and dry seasons describe general climatic trends each spanning an extended period of six months. Also, returning to test water points that have been temporarily inaccessible within the same season would reduce the volume of missing data and thus allow the determination of any meaningful relationships that may have been obscured in this study. Thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ali. That was really clear. I'm just trying to get my video to come back on. Um, has anyone got any questions for Ali? I'm sure there must be some. Maybe just when they're thinking. Can I ask you, you, you highlighted that there were a number of uncollected samples. Do you think that's just a kind of nature of trying to work in Malawi and remote communities can that be improved or is it just something you think that future investigators are going to have to live with because it's just kind of part of the ecosystem you're working within? Yeah, I think it's a mixture of the two. Um, certainly it is a complication of real world, world research um, and there are certainly some factors that can't be helped, um, like communities not wanting their water point to be tested or... Um, weather conditions sort of flooding and things rendering the water point in, in, unusable or inaccessible um but at the same time there are sort of um systemic things so we um fishermen's rest will only go and test um a water point once in each season um whereas it could be valuable um where the resources allow if the water point is temporarily rendered inaccessible by flooding or something to then revisit that once the weather is improved um, because people will start using the water point again so therefore it is important it's, um, to, to retest it each season so um, with more sort of personnel, personnel and, and a bigger team they would be able to go out and, and retest within the same season so that could be a potential um, improvement there. Great thank you do we have any other questions for Ali, or you must have explained some, everything so clearly that you stunned them to silence. <laughs> there was a wee hand went up and then just disappeared again there. Oh, yes, James. <clears throat> Thanks, Ali. Um, I, I enjoyed that. Sorry, it, it, it might be my, I missed it or my ignorance, um, but just in terms of the, the methods, the methodology, I think you say it was like a complete case analysis or a complete case 
uh, study. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. So could you describe that in a little more detail for us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, we had five seasons of data um, and not every water point had all five values. Um, so I was kind of looking at it um, it was quite difficult to decide initially what we were going to do. So initially the, the data was a continuous sort of how many microorganisms, how many bacteria were there. Um, however, there were some issues with um, numbers being too high to count. Um, so we had to convert this to original data. So it put it at in risk levels, which is um, what was displayed on the graphs a bit earlier in the presentation. Um, however, over the five seasons, we don't know how many samples are required to produce a meaningful valid result in terms of is this water point at risk or is it not at risk? Um, and therefore I could, there was potential to do some sort of power analysis and imputation um, to try and estimate the missing values um, or to see if say four samples were enough to decide whether a uh, water point was at risk or not. However, um, due to the limit of the extent of data and the limit of sort of time and statistical expertise from myself, I decided to go for a complete case approach. So that, that basically meant that if there weren't five seasons of data, that hand pump was not included in the analysis, it was disregarded. So it was only those with complete data that were um, included in those uh, in the assessment of whether it was at risk or not. Does that make sense? Uh, it does, thank you. Yeah. And so what proportion of, were missed? Really? So there was over half of the water points were had to be disregarded um, in terms of um, my study. Um, and that was why I think there is still potential value to be um, gained from the same data set. Um, as I say, if we can do some sort of imputation or um, some sort of, yeah, statistical things that are maybe out of my depth, um, we th there is potential there for um, gaining further insights um, rather than kind of starting from, uh, starting again or investing more money in, in a different type of testing. Okay, thank you for allowing me to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, um, James and Ali. I think just for the sake of time, we probably need to move on. So thank you very much for that. And next, we have a complete change of focus and Andrew McLeod's going to tell us about his project, which he carried out within the Cardiovascular and Diabetes Medicine, BMSC. All right, hopefully everybody can see and hear me all right. And I shall attempt to share my screen. So let's see. Yeah, that's hopefully good. everyone can oh, see it all good. Yeah, that's perfect. So whenever you're ready, we're good to go. Thank you. All right, brilliant. So yeah, so I'm Andrew, and um, hopefully everyone's doing well. And today I'm going to be discussing the link between Alzheimer's disease and alterations in metabolism. Um, and this is data analysis of experimental work carried by Dr. McLean, who is working in the lab with Professor Meg Ashford. Um, and so it's yeah, Dr. Fiona McLean's work, and I used various different techniques to analyze it. So in terms of why this work was being carried out, first of all, as many of you may know, Alzheimer's is a common progressive neurodegenerative disease. It's characterized primarily by memory loss and cognitive impairment. It's the single largest cause of dementia, accounting for about 50% to 75% of all cases of the condition. And it puts massive burden on public health services, financial strain, there's strain in terms of staffing of NHS, not to mention emotional strain on the families of individuals affected by it. Rates are increasing and we don't yet fully understand what causes it. We know certain key risk factors, but we don't fully understand the reason why it develops. To add to this problem, we don't really have any effective cure for it. We do have some treatments that are available, but the current treatments are more geared towards alleviating symptoms of the condition as opposed to actually tackling the underlying disease pathophysiology. And some of that may be because the pathophysiology of the condition is pretty complicated. We, we don't know fully what's going on. We're learning more all the time. In particular, there's been recent emphasis in the literature on 
regarding the role of the blood-brain barrier and impact that the condition may have on blood vessels, particularly microvessels in the brain. Another relatively recent finding is the fact that there seems to be this bi-directional relationship between Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes, whereby having type 2 diabetes is known to increase your risk of Alzheimer's, but interestingly, having Alzheimer's is also known to increase your risk of developing and going on to develop type 2 diabetes. So to unpick some of this link and some of this um, pathophysiology a bit further, um, in Dr. McLean's work, she used a mouse model known as the TGSWDI model. This is basically a transgenic mouse model whereby there's a strain of the mouse line that involves three specific mutations that essentially lead to overexpression of this protein amyloid precursor protein. This happens largely in endothelial cells. And what overexpression of this protein will later result in is a development in the formation of amyloid plaques. And these plaques are one of the key pathological features of Alzheimer's disease. So in this mouse strain that had this mutation, this, these three mutations and had overexpression of this protein, we used two key time points, which was a three month time point was used to collect data. And this was considered a pre-pathology time point because while there was overexpression of this protein, there wasn't yet a widespread diffuse establishment of these amyloid plaques. By six months, however, there was overexpression of the amyloid precursor protein and there was a widespread development of these plaques. So to collect data at these two time points, various different techniques were used. Echo MRI was used to get a measurement of overall body mass, as well as specifically fat and lean mass in these mice. Coded tail cuff sampling was used to record blood pressure and heart rate. You can see the little tube in the middle right of the screen, and that shows what that looks like. Laser Doppler imaging was used for measuring peripheral blood flow in the mice, while laser speckle imaging was able to measure brain blood flow in the mice. Various other tests were done to look at glucose metabolism in these mice with both oral glucose tolerance tests and an intraperitoneal insulin tolerance test being carried out. And I should say that all these techniques were carried out in the mutated mouse line and also in a similar sized control group of C57 mice. So various different findings came out. Um, first one I'll talk about is body composition. What we saw was that while fat and lean mass increased in both the control and the transgenic group, there was a statistically significantly greater increase in the proportion of overall mass that was fat mass in the APP overexpression mouse line. And essentially what that boils down to is potentially this suggests something about having this overexpression of APP is altering the body composition of this mutated mouse line and leading in effect to a worse or a less healthy body composition with more fat mass, less lean mass. In terms of blood pressure, Going from three to six months, there's a significant increase in blood pressure in the transgenic mouse line, with that same increase being absent in the control group. And this was consistent across both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And this suggests some form of role potentially for APP overexpression having an effect on blood pressure, whether that's through altering the regulation of systemic vascular resistance or other factors wouldn't yet be clear. But an interesting finding, not necessarily one that's hypothesized. Looking at the glucose tolerance test, at three months, both the control group and the transgenic mouse line were quite similar in their graph. However, by six months, it's clear that the purple line representing the transgenic mouse line has almost entirely been shifted upwards in terms of the glucose excursion. And when, when looking at the fasted blood glucose, it shows that actually that increase, that shift of that line upwards has been driven almost purely by an increased baseline blood glucose in the transgenic mouse group. And an increased baseline blood glucose, in fact, uh, increased fasted blood glucose could suggest there's been a disruption to the regulation of glucose metabolism. And with hepatic gluconeogenesis being one of the primary drivers of the baseline blood glucose, this could potentially suggest that something about the interaction between insulin and the liver is being disrupted. And this is coming from APP overexpression. So something about the glucose metabolism is, is obviously being altered here. The same effect was mirrored in the insulin tolerance test, although interesting, the, this time, already at three months, the transgenic mouse group are starting to beat their lines shifted upwards. And again, this is driven by an increased fasted blood glucose, again, suggesting that there's a disturbance to glucose metabolism in the transgenic mouse group. Looking at peripheral blood flow, laser doctor and gym is carried out with several different chemicals infused to elicit certain responses. Water was given first to establish a baseline before phenylephrine was infused to elicit maximal constriction. At the end, acetylcholine was given to induce maximal vasodilation. And um, so this graph just shows the results from three months and there isn't a whole lot of difference between the transgenic mice and the control C57 mice. By six months, there was no significant changes 
but it does appear that there's a trend potentially emerging of the transgenic mice line being higher in response to acetylcholine phase. And I think it would be interesting if this data was to be continued and pathology was allowed to progress and the mice were recorded at say nine months to see if this initial divergence near the end of this graph would have further spread apart by nine months or whether it's more of a random finding. Looking at brain blood flow, however, there was a, a quite striking, drastically increased baseline blood flow in the transgenic mice compared to the control group. This wasn't something that was hypothesized, but there was a phenomenon dis discussed in the literature in relation to Alzheimer's disease known as neuroexcitotoxicity. And that could explain this because what that essentially refers to is that in response to some form of initial insult or injury, neurons enter a kind of hyper excitable state, could be likened to a kind of panic state, whereby they become more active and receive more blood flow. In this theory, what would then happen is later on, as neurons start to die off or be impaired in their function, that blood flow going to them would drop. And when we look at the six month graph, that would fit with that picture in terms of by six months, the baseline blood flow and the post stimulus blood flow in the transgenic mouse group has dropped down much closer to the control group. And this is another area where it'd be really interesting to see if this data was continued to look at in nine months with time allowed for the pathology to progress. Would that blood flow of the transgenic mouse group have even now dropped below the control group? It'd be interesting to see and it was quite a significant finding. So to conclude, a variety of changes across various different aspects of metabolism and vascular function have been observed here, coming from a model largely of endothelial cell APP overexpression. And while you may expect that, and we know that causes plaques to form in the brain, the fact that it's having such wide-ranging effects across a variety of different organ systems is quite striking. And it suggests that perhaps a traditional view of Alzheimer's is purely a disease of the brain isn't quite accurate, with effects being seen potentially in the liver, across various vascular areas all over the body and I think it, it suggests a, a future role really for looking at the effect that Alzheimer's is having and what's happening in the Alzheimer's pathophysiology, pathophysiological process not only in the brain but in all organ systems with particular reference to the liver and the effects going on there. So in terms of future work where, where should we go next? I think an important step would be single cell sequencing all of these effects are kind of at the tissue level, these are carried out in whole mice, but it'd be good to do sequencing of single cells to really enhance our understanding of what specifically is happening in terms of gene expression, particularly if genes and proteins are relevant to pathways involved in insulin resistance and uh, regulation of glucose metabolism. And in doing this, it'd be good to look at endothelial cells, which are one of the main components of the blood-brain barrier in the brain, but also at the other cell types in the uh, blood-brain barrier, such as astrocytes, which play an important role. Finally, I think it'd be good to, to further our understanding of the kind of temporal relationship of these changes emerging here, like the metabolic and vascular changes, and see how do they fit in with the kind of cognitive changes that we know happen in humans and Alzheimer's. And this could even be looked at in mice with something like a novel object recognition test to see, you know, are mice starting to suffer cognitive impairment before they're getting these changes and alterations in glucose metabolism, or is it the inverse of that with these changes such as increased fasted blood glucose are these subtle early signs of Alzheimer's that could be picked up on and potentially even used for a kind of early, ident early identification and perhaps early intervention of the condition. Some important questions raised and some significant findings from this work. Thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Has anybody got any questions for Andrew? I can see we've got some Alzheimer's and some diabetes experts with us online just as people are are thinking about questions andrew can i ask you you know if you were if you were going to be taking this project forward or the or the wider research team was mm -hmm. how how do you think you you start to think about how extrapolatable if that's a word your data is to to humans and where would you go next are there other mouse models that you might use that might you might want first to check they did a similar thing or is this model completely unique and how would you kind of take that data forward in a more in a sort of translational direction sure well yeah those are some really good and important questions and it certainly is something you'd want to think about i mean i suppose fundamentally this model is only simulating alzheimer's disease it isn't actually that these mice have alzheimer's obviously so again to to find out where that's actually translatable is an important step um whether there's other mouse models that would be, be helpful. I mean, this one does seem quite accurate in terms of its allowing the plaques to develop. 
And I suppose an aspect that I haven't discussed is the fact that increasingly in Alzheimer's, we know it's not just about the plaques. And there's theories in the literature suggesting that plaques are almost more the body's defense to the actual pathophysiology of Alzheimer's. So in some ways, we don't know. It could be a really good model that's really simulating what's happening in Alzheimer's, or maybe that actually plaques are only kind of a byproduct of Alzheimer's, and that this model doesn't necessarily simulate Alzheimer's that well. Um, but this is a, a model that is used in literature and has been used by other, other groups working on projects like this. In terms of talking about the bidirectional relationship, I think there's work being done using a separate model whereby you almost have insulin resistant mice and almost verifying the inverse of this. Do these mice have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's from having the kind of glucose metabolism changes first? I think that would be good work to continue and see if that link exists. I suppose as well, if this this work kind of continues and you see more changes at nine months, it might help even to move up to slightly larger mammals. You can see if this, you know, if it works in mice, does it work in rats? And then there's always a possibility of, of using larger mammals and seeing if that works. But of course it is that balance and that, you know, animal works great, but you don't always know, you know, mice don't have the same brains as humans and don't necessarily work in the same way. Yeah, and of course it gives you some really kind of low hanging fruit that you could test in clinical samples quite easily, like your blood pressure changes, for example, setting Absolutely. up a clinical study would be great absolutely you have a question thanks very much for that that's very interesting um it's the second time i've heard you speak um because i heard it the first time but a really <laughs> competent presentation very interesting i love the work um you know very difficult project um lots to consider um i'm interested in what are the other ramifications so obviously you've been speaking about alzheimer's but are there other ways that you could use this mouse model to look at you know to model other diseases that might be linked to you know diabetes and insulin yeah. resistance etc i suppose you could and certainly in, in the fact that this is a, a model whereby at least to start with these mice have well-functioning pancreases and endocrine systems that are by and large normal and the disturbance to say your insulin resistance or your, your insulin sensitivity is largely coming from as far as we're aware the app overexpression or at least a consequence of it so i suppose to almost model the kind of effects you get the western diet in terms of insulin resistance happening kind of through or happening in otherwise relatively initially healthy individuals it could be mm -hmm. helpful for that from the kind of insulin resistance picture in a physiology that has a healthy pancreas and otherwise relatively healthy endocrine system mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. We've probably just got time for one final question from Damien. Hi, Andrew. Thank you. That was really a um, great presentation. Very clear. I'm just wondering, so my interest is in um, fatty liver disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've got the um, scans looking at adiposity or, or general body fat versus lean body mass. But I wonder if you've got sort of any information on visceral adiposity and, and in particular sort of um, um, certainly uh, um, imaging looking at liver fat and liver steatosis. There seems to be evidence of linking marsled fatty liver disease mm -hmm. with vascular dementia, which I guess goes with a kind of whole metabolic dysfunction phenotype, but not necessarily with Alzheimer's. And I just wonder if your mice have increased liver fat in particular, as well as sort of um, uh, whole body fat. Sure. So I think that's actually a really important question. And it's not something we particularly looked at. The echo MRI is good and it's accurate in what it does, but it doesn't really give you any data beyond, as far as I'm aware, specifics of total fat, total lean mass, not the kind of distribution of that fat mass and whether it's more visceral or subcutaneous kind of thing. Um, and I think actually that would be something that'd be good to know. And in particular, with this picture of insulin resistance developing, it'd be good to know what other aspects of metabolic syndrome, like as you say, increased risk of mazzled are present with that. And we know there are potential effects in the liver, but whether that's related to kind of steatosis or separate so, problems. Yeah, Marzal can drive insulin resistance. So I guess it's exactly. which way around it is. So yeah, yeah, it'd be Indeed. interesting to look at. Definitely. Great, thank you very much. I guess that's an old hand from you, Steve. And for the sake of time, I think we probably need to move on. So thank you very much, Andrew. That no was problem. great. And the final presentation in this session changing topic again is from Thomas McDonough who studied BMSC medical education last year and he's going to tell us about his project work. Hello. Hello. We can hear you but not see you at the moment Thomas. 
can use. Oh, yeah. You look like you're sitting in a very... Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a bit broken, but hopefully it'll be fine. Do you want to try sharing your slides and check that that works okay? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. I'm really sorry. I'm on GP placement at the moment, and the Wi-Fi is really not good at all. Is that working? That go just now. Yeah, that's good. Just go into presenter mode, and then I think we're good. Is that good? That's good. So for the moment, we can hear and see you. So let's go for it and hope that your Wi-Fi holds up. Okay. Yeah, apologies. Um, the Wi-Fi in the practice isn't great, but we'll see how we get on. Um, so hi, everyone. My name's Thomas, and I did a medical education BMSE last year. Um, and this is my project, which was an exploration of junior doctors' experiences and perceptions of values-based reflective practice. Now, for those of you wondering, what is values-based reflective practice? Well, GBRP, as it's more commonly known, is a group reflective model um, that is unique to NHS Scotland. And it was created um, to help healthcare staff deliver the care that they came into the service to provide. So it operates as reflective groups um, and it involves um, different groups of staff. So that might be um, clinical staff on a ward or it might be staff in a GP practice. Um, and they're essentially reflective sessions um, that involve um, consideration of the staff's core values and morals. Um, and they sort of discuss areas that have arisen in their practice that might have potentially particularly challenged them or that have, it's something that's been um, quite profound to them. And the idea is they can engage in these reflective sessions for in a sort of proactive and preventative way to sort of address any issues that may arise. Um, and these sessions are obviously lay, um, led by a trained facilitator. Um, as with most tools, um, VBRP has its own unique um, reflective tools. As you can see, there's three um, on the screen here. So for time's sake, I won't go into all of them, but I'll just draw your attention to the three levels of seeing tool that you can see in the bottom here. And that's one of the tools uh, unique to VBRP that I found particularly useful. And that uses the phrases, I notice, I wonder, I realize, to um, elicit reflective conversations between colleagues. So you might say, I notice you're feeling particularly down today. I wonder what's what's upsetting you. And it's just a, sort of a good tool to use, in my opinion, um, to sort of reflect and um, engage in open conversation without sort of passing judgment. So I thought I'd just draw your attention to that tool. So for a bit of context, why did I decide to do my research project um, on this reflective model? So as you will all be well aware, the NHS is under significant pressures at the moment. And as a result, it's staff that are facing the consequences. And research has actually shown that junior doctors of all um, interprofessional groups are the most likely to suffer from work-related burnout and mental ill health. Um, so we want to do something to combat that um, and to um, hopefully retain our doctors in, in the service and, and not lose them to other health services or other countries, um, as we're seeing at the moment. So reflective practice has then been considered as a potential coping mechanism for, for these staff to deal with the challenges, not as a sort of long-term solution, but as a um, short-term coping mechanism to, to deal with these contemporary pressures that the services are facing. And actually, research has shown that it does have a real positive impact on um, burnout and um, resilience among staff. And particularly peer support groups um, have particularly resonated with junior doctors. So given these sort of two pieces of evidence, I thought, why not um, assess this um, reflective model, VBRP, which is relatively new and it's unique to NHS Scotland, and see whether that has any positive impact amongst um, junior doctors working in NHS Scotland. So that was sort of the rationale for the study. And then given that, um, and given uh, in my literature review, I had noticed time and time again that these three key areas were coming up again in relation to reflective practice um, among junior doctors. So I decided to look at the value of BBRP in relation to doctors' personal well-being, their professional development, and how it contributes to their delivery of person-centred care. 
For my um, data collection, I conducted one-to-one -one interviews with a small group of junior doctors from different clinical backgrounds. And I used phenomenology as my research paradigm um, to sort of have an in-depth exploration of their experience with BBRP. And as you can see in the diagram there, that was my interview guide that I used to get a thorough exploration of their experience. And then again, as you can see in this diagram, um, I used Broad and Clark's six step approach to thematic analysis to um, get my results from my interviews. And these were my key findings that I um, deciphered from the interviews. So I got four key themes with 13 sub themes. And the, the four themes are personal growth, fostering a supportive working culture, delivery of person-centered care, and barriers to use in practice. Now, you'll see that I've um, color-coded them specifically, and I've done that on purpose, um, because as I was looking at these results, um, I realized that while I do have four key themes, I thought I had three levels at play. So I'll just go on to explain that here. So my first theme of personal growth relates to the individual and the influence that values-based reflective practice have on personal attributes. So I thought I would sort of talk about um, those um, findings on an intrapersonal level. Then to, going on to the next two themes of delivery of um, person-centered care and fostering a supportive working culture, I realized that those two um, findings kind of go hand in hand. So they relate to relationships among healthcare professionals, which, among colleagues, and between doctor and patient. So I thought that those themes sort of describe the value of, of the EBRP um, on an interpersonal level. So I thought it would be important to discuss them together. And then finally, my last theme that is barriers to use in practice talks about the challenges or the practicalities of integrating EBRP into the healthcare system. And I felt that that was a theme that spoke about um, how it would be integrated on an organizational level. So I thought if I break it down into these three areas, it would be more digestible and uh, easy to understand in a three levels approach. So yeah, as you can see, um, the participants felt that their engagement with BBRP um, helped them to be more resilient and it helped with their um, self-awareness of themselves and how they react in different situations. It gave them positive coping mechanisms to deal with the challenges that they face. Exercises made them more naturally reflective in their day-to-day -day activities. Then on an interpersonal level, between colleagues, it seems to work with honesty and integrity. And as you can see, one participant felt a sense of camaraderie coming away from these reflective groups. They also shared as a problem half, so they felt that discussing in these groups was was really helpful with supporting each other. And then it also helped to build teamwork to patient relationships. So that tool that I mentioned at the book, the beginning seemed to be really useful in discussing treatment routes with a, a patient. So you might say, um, I noticed this symptom is particularly worrying you. I wonder if shared decision making and enhancing that, that doctor patient relationship. There was sort of some negative um, perceptions in terms of how it would be practiced. Now, the biggest one being time constraints, the participants all felt that, well, this is a really great tool that perhaps is not possible or feasible to um, take time out to engage in these reflective groups. And also, it's difficult if you're working in a busy ward or a busy practice that you might not be able to um, take everyone away from their jobs and, and sit around and, and discuss the matters that have arisen that day. And finally, also reflection is a innately personal and quite emotional um, activity for some people. So there are sort of people would be quite reluctant or perhaps um, less wanting to engage in that with colleagues if they're if they're not sort of comfortable with the team. So 
those were some negatives that we, we found alongside the sort of wealth of positives. So just to conclude, my study did find that VBRP holds great promise as a valuable reflective tool. It was shown to facilitate personal growth, foster a supportive working culture, and also did promote the delivery of person-centred care. However, as I mentioned, there are significant practical challenges that prevent its implementation in practice. Finally, just some recommendations for um, implementation and future research. Given its benefits, it would be would be good if we could perhaps integrate some awareness of BBRP into um, professional development programs for junior doctors. We could try integrating it into clinical team meetings and um, to see if that helps and um, build team rapport and things like that. But we also, of course, have to adapt, uh, explore the potential of BBRP to be more adaptable. Um, it's all well and good that we have this beneficial tool, but if it can't be used in practice, then it's not very good at all. And, and then for future research, my study was a very small scale study and um, VBRP is not a well known or um, well used tool at the moment. So I didn't have many participants. So uh, larger stu studies with more doctors or other healthcare professionals would be very beneficial. And also perhaps a longitudinal evaluation where we look at the same cohort over a long period of time and see how it helps them throughout their career. So yeah, um, just a little take home message using that tool that I've mentioned throughout. I noticed contemporary pressures on our health service are negatively impacting junior doctors' wellbeing. I wonder what can be done to combat these pressures and support junior doctors in their work. I realised from this study, BBRP is a worthwhile investment to support junior doctors with their personal wellbeing, professional development, and delivery of person-centred care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was really nice to see you bringing your introductory slide back to your conclusion slide there at the end. Do we have any questions? I see Steve Gell at least got his hand up. Just rejoin. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, well done for battling the, um, the GP surgery Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> You must be in a rural place or something like that. But um, yeah, it's always a bit stressful, but <clears throat> it came across very well. So don't worry, it, it never impacted. Um, yeah, just I've, I've got a question. You mentioned there was some logistical challenges around this. Um, how do you think, what, what's, your, what's your proposal in terms of actually dealing with those? And also what's already in place in terms of reflective practice? Because this is a new system from what I gather. Is there something already there that's not quite working? How does that fit in? Thanks. Yeah, so um, for the sort of first half of your question, um, I think that it's difficult to, it's not feasible to take everyone away from their tasks, perhaps on the ward and get them to sit in a room for half an hour and discuss the challenges that they've had that day. That's just not at all possible. But I think Perhaps the idea would be um, to introduce this tool to people and um, perhaps through uh, if they have learning time or professional development time or things like that, so that they learn um, those tools that I mentioned, the, the notice, wonder, realize, um, the different tools this um, reflective model offers. And rather than having perhaps reflective groups um, in a clinical setting, you can have lots of practitioners who have an awareness of, of these tools and, and they could use that um, in their day-to-day -day interactions. So while it perhaps may not be how it originally set out to be as reflective groups, um, if they have an awareness and, and know how to use the tools, then perhaps um, that would be a good way that it is still usable in a clinical environment. Mm. Um, and then for the second part of your question, Having a look at a lot of literature um, for my dissertation, I found that um, obviously at the moment, a lot of reflection is written and it's for um, online portfolios and things like that. And people seem to think that written reflections can be quite contrived and you do it because it's like a kind of tick boxy exercise and they seem more willing to engage in it if it's something different, if it's not just sitting down writing um, things that they've saw and, and how that impacted them and things like that if it's a more um, engaging exercise people seem to get more out of it so perhaps this is a more beneficial tool in that sense 
That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you, um, Thank Thomas. You. I was going to ask you a similar question, which I think you've already partially answered in response to Steve there. Do you think um, under the sort of time pressures of typical junior doctors where you might not be able to do this as often as you might ideally like to, do you think there's a benefit to just introducing it into every team? And even if they only did it once, that's something they can maybe build on? Or do you think to get maximum benefit, it's something that junior doctors would really have to be engaging in regularly and perhaps throughout their training? No, I don't think so at all. I think just getting that out there, it's not something that people are very well versed in or have even heard of before. So I think having just an awareness of uh, here's the tools that um, this reflective model offers and um, use them if you like them, don't if you don't, but um, having an awareness of them is, is really beneficial. I know having not done values-based reflective practice before, I find myself at coming away and using those phrases. I notice, I wonder in sort of everyday interactions following that. And um, so, so just, yeah, just, it doesn't have to be a sort of a dedicated engagement with the tool. It's just an awareness that this is available to you. If you find it beneficial, then, then, then use it. Great. Thank you very much. Can I just check, because we're now moving Thank on you. to the, perhaps the most important thing where I'm going to ask you all to vote for your best presentation. I think the standard has been incredibly high today. So I think actually before we carry out the vote, I'd like to thank all three student presenters and I suppose apologise in advance that only one of you can be um, given the Sir James Mackenzie Prize because you all really gave excellent talks today. Can I just check if someone from the Tilt team is on the call and is able to share Mike's beautiful Mentimeter slide? Because otherwise I'm going to have to do it myself, which might be a bit of a high risk um, operation. I think we were he was hoping that someone would have joined us and could put the slide up. In the event that's not happening, let me try resharing my own screen. I might need advice if you're on the call. Oh, no, brilliant, fantastic. We have an expert in our midst. So we're going to open the voting. It's great to have such a large online audience. It's really great to have such a diverse audience. So please do take just a couple of minutes. We'll let the vote run for a couple of minutes. So we're finished before two o'clock. and. Let me just log in myself because I'm on a different screen. It's a very silly question, but how, how do I do it? Um, <laughs> so if you go to menti.com on any Oh, okay. Device, so you log into a website. I was trying to click the screen. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and use that code. Yeah. Use that code. That should take you to the vote. It does indeed. Hi there, Julian. It's Phil here from the Tilt team. I've just temporarily hidden the responses until give it a minute or two, and then I'll open yeah. the responses so we can see them. I think that might be a, a better way of doing it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. I've just managed to vote myself. Gold star to me. So everyone, other people might still be logging in as well. So we could start a slow drum roll in the background. We'll maybe just leave it for another minute just to let everyone join in online. That was much easier than I thought it would be. So um, <laughs> thank you for introducing me to Mentimeter. Mike Latter did all the hard work. I was just <laughs> traumatized by the thought. I'm going to have to use that, that in my lectures. It's a very good tool. Um, I'm just waiting for us to go to 1358 before we re release the result so that I know people will have to rush off to two o'clock meetings. I think we've probably got We've probably given people enough time. So, Phil, if you would like to press your magic button. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a situation we've never been in before. Okay. Oh, are we still voting? Oh, by a very, very narrow margin then. 
Have you closed it, Phil, or are people still able to vote? No, I've not closed it. It's still open. Okay, I think since it's two minutes to two o'clock, by the narrowest of margins, I... Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think actually I've we've never been in this situation before, but I think as program lead, I'm just going to have to take an executive decision here on behalf of the school. I saw that the dean was on the call certainly earlier, and we're just going to have to jointly award the Sir James Mackenzie Prize this year because I think that's the only fair um, conclusion. But again, I'd really like to thank all three speakers. All the talks were really excellent. You are a great credit to the BMSC program. And leave me to explain myself to Mike Latter when he comes back from annual leave and he will be in touch um, shortly to explain how the prizes will be awarded. So thank you very much, everyone. A minute to two and we've just got in there on time. <laughs>